welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Today we're going to talk about some recent developments in China. Those developments include some COVID-related lockdowns, warning signs about the housing market in China, and also the evolving relationship between China and Russia in the wake of the war in Ukraine. My guest today is Dr. Jack Howe. Dr. Howe is a professor of economics, and he is also an expert in China's economic development history. Welcome, Jack, and thank you for joining us again on Talking Points. My pleasure, my pleasure. Well, Jack, we've talked several times on this program about China's economic history, as well as the relationship between China, the United States, and uh, in the realm of trade, international trade. But the last time we talked was before the pandemic began. And so we're going to start right with the pandemic today because it continues to this day. We're still seeing the ripple effect of it in China. The big news now is the total lockdown in Shanghai. It's made the news. Everyone's hearing about it. This is because of the zero tolerance policy for COVID in China. So let's start with Shanghai. Why is China pursuing the zero policy, zero COVID policy or zero tolerance for COVID policy? And what's the impact on Shanghai? Well, China, in, uh, as far as we know, is the only major, uh, major current, uh, country that has the zero tolerance. Uh, I can understand why they are doing it, uh, but uh, it comes with a tremendous cost. Just to give people an idea, uh, Shanghai is the worst case. Previously, it was a Shenzhen. That was bad enough. Shanghai is even worse. It's more densely populated. To give you an idea, to give our audience an idea, Shanghai's density of population is close to 9,000 per square kilometer. In context, that would be equivalent to uh, 18,000 people at Cal State Long Beach, living on Cal State Long Beach. So you can imagine if there is a spread, it can be I don't want to use the catastrophic, but it's going to be significant. So I can understand what they're doing. But the cost is uh, tremendous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we'll get to the cost in a minute. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We're going to take a look at the impact on uh, China's biggest harbor, I believe. Yes. Uh, and that we have an image that we're going to show right now, which shows the harbor. And Jack, tell us about what that image presents. Well, this image, uh, uh, I cannot vouch for the authenticity of this, but qualitatively gets the point across. This is basically a uh, digital representation of the ships, the cargo containers and other uh, maritime vessels that are scattered outside of uh, Shanghai. Shanghai has been the world's, the world's largest cargo container for 12 years in a row. 12 years in a row. So a shutdown or even a slowdown will have not just catastrophic effect on China, but globally. If you think our uh, supply chain issue was bad, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. All right, well, let's take a look at the next graphic, which shows ships waiting to load or discharge at Shanghai. And you can see that that graphic shows uh, the average and what happened in 2021, which is represented by that green line, but that red line represents today, 2022, as of March. It's straight up, Jack. Exactly, exactly. And uh, the problem with Shanghai, as I said, not just the uh, population density, not just be being the world's largest uh, cargo container, the city of Shanghai with 26 million people accounting for a large chunk of China's GDP. And let's not forget the external, the spillover effect. When Ch uh, Shanghai slows down, a lot of the other cities that depend on Shanghai to import the goods they need or export their products are slowed down. Yes, they can divert to other places, but it takes time and it's more expensive. So these are all going to be repercussions. Uh, the only good news I can think of is, thank God it's not Christmas shopping season yet. Exactly. And so if we go to the next graphic, we can see the ships waiting to load or discharge at Shanghai. And this gives an idea of the types of ships. It breaks it down by the dry bulk carriers. That's the red area on the lower end of the graphic on the right side. We have the tankers. That's represented by green. Container ships, that's what affects us most here in the yes. supply chain, as you mentioned. Gray, that's a large number of container ships and some other various ships related there. But 
Altogether, this shows us the picture of the slowdown, shutdown or slowdown in that harbor. It's not good for the supply chain, as you mentioned. Yes, and uh, just to give people an idea, uh, Tesla, Tesla used to have a big presence in California, now they're shifting to uh, Texas, but more than 50% of all the Teslas produced are in Shanghai. Right. Uh, Tesla has a gigafactory in Shanghai producing more than 50%, and Tesla is scheduled to be shut down for a month. Wow. And Tesla is notorious uh, for having subcontractors. That's why a lot of people complain. Uh, Tesla's body is made up, made by seven different producers. That's why people complain that the uh, panels don't fit that well. So you can imagine when Tesla shut down, the spillover effect, not just to Shanghai, but to other factories related to uh, Tesla, maybe in Wuhan, maybe in Changsha, I don't know, but these will have repercussions to a supply chain. In Europe, they have already announced and uh, told Tesla uh, buyers that they have to wait an extra month. All right, so the slowdown of the supply chain will continue, as you mentioned, but we need to continue on with what we're talking about, which is looking at other uh, issues that have developed in China recently. And one of those is looking at the impact of the one-child policy. Now, one-child policy was adopted uh, you know, several decades ago, and now we're seeing the impact of that with the net increase labor force, which is actually a negative net increase. We have a graphic to uh, indicate what's going on there. It's pretty clear the trend is going down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They don't have the folks available for the workforce that they used to, and it's going to continue to go down in the future. So that's one of the impacts of the uh, uh, one-child policy. So uh, what's going to happen as a result of the reduction of people in the workforce in China? Uh, a lot of people seem to be alarmed by it. I am personally uh, more optimistic. Maybe I shouldn't use the word optimistic. I'm less pessimistic uh, because uh, artificial intelligence, technology, and China's desire to move to the higher end of the value chain, in other words, move away from labor-intensive manufacturing to uh, more technology capital intensive production where they can have, have a bigger profit margin, uh, that will largely allevi alleviate this problem. I remember in a previous show, I emphasized my concern is not in the labor force, not in the production. My concern is uh, with the aging population, the health care cost. That could be an uh, extremely heavy burden whether it's going to be an unbearing uh, burden, we will wait and see. All right, well, another aspect of the uh, declining population because of the one-child policy is going to impact the housing market. In the intro, I mentioned that there are warnings, warning signs for the housing market in China, particularly for the future. And just to give an indication here, J.P. Morgan has estimated that demand for housing in China will, will go down by as much as 47% by the year 2030. So uh, what's going to happen in China? How will they be able to replace that housing demand? Because housing represents something like 25% of the GDP if you add all of the aspects of real estate, construction, finance, uh, furnishings, and so forth. So how can they replace that in terms of an investment uh, strategy in China. If it's not going into housing, what can they do to uh, pick up the slack? Uh, Dave, you are exactly right. The housing market is, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I don't want to use the word backbone, but it's certainly, certainly a significant uh, aspect of China's investment, finance, uh, and such. Culturally, the Chinese save a lot more than the West, a lot more. And because of their limited investment channels, uh, unlike our stock uh, bonds, we can buy uh, European, Japanese stocks and things like that. Japan, uh, uh, sorry, China is pretty much limited domestically. And their stock market has had some catastrophic uh, crashes. So people don't have the confidence. And real estate culturally has been something that is important to the Chinese. But with the uh, aging population, with the one-child policy, demand naturally will shrink, and most of the families already have their own apartments. Most of them have multiple. 
So uh, the demand for this will naturally shrink. But again, uh, the, uh, I always try to look at, I wouldn't say the silver lining, but uh, more optimistic, as I said, again. Because China's apartment, unlike the US, where the, whether you stay in an apartment or the, uh, the house or apartment is resold over and over again, China tends to demolish them and build new ones. With the uh, shrinkage of the population and more and more families now have multiple children, they will need apartments with more rooms. So I look at it as a potential way out is to demolish the old ones where they only have two bedrooms, the parents and the single child. Now they will be demolishing them, building bigger apartments with two, three, dare I say, four uh, uh, rooms. So I think that that is a potential. I'm not a real estate economics expert, but I do think that could be their way out. I'd like to talk for a moment about the other aspect of real estate and housing in China that we heard a lot about in the past year, and that has to do with the default of Evergrande, mm -hmm. a huge housing developer. And the same JP Morgan uh, report I quoted a moment ago also indicated that they believe that about 18.2% of all property developers in China are at risk of default, and about 15.4% are at high risk of default. Is that becoming a concern, a problem? It is obviously uh, a concern. That's why the uh, Chinese government has historically propped up a lot of these developers, but uh, they are starting to shift in their strategy and uh, with some control, allowing some of these developers to go bankrupt, default, and uh, perhaps weed out the uh, weaker ones. Uh, they know it's coming. Uh, and this is related to how the financial sector works in China. Most of the banks in China are either nationally or provincially or at least city owned. So the uh, developers, they are closely linked with the government officials. They are corruption. There's no doubt about that. So that's why a lot of these developers, from a Western point of view, they are not qualified for these loans. Why are they getting it? Because of corruption, because of kickbacks. And the Chinese government are trying to straighten this out. On that note, Jack, we're going to have to go to the break. And so when we come back from the break, we'll talk about China's bridge and road initiative and also the relationship and how it's changing between China and Russia over the Ukraine war. Stay tuned. OK, Dad. One, two. Three. You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach, and my guest today is Dr. Jack Howe. We're talking about China and recent developments in China. And Jack, before we went to the break, we had just finished up talking about uh, some of the impacts from real estate defaults and the potential of defaults. But uh, in reality, China's economy is actually doing pretty well. Uh, in spite of the Shanghai lockdown that we mentioned, uh, some supply chain disruption, and again, the housing market we just finished talking about, they're estimated to have about somewhere between 5% and 5.5% GDP growth in China, which is pretty good considering that we're, we are coming out of the pandemic. So one of the reasons why they're doing so well is because of the bridge and road initiative and other things related to that, which means uh, China, again, is, uh, developing all kinds of connections and infrastructure and corporate relationships in other countries. So we have a graphic right now that shows us the Bridge Road Initiative. When we first started talking about that a few years ago, Jack, we talked about it as the Belt and Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, you let me know that uh, they actually changed the name from Belt and Road to Bridge Road Initiative. Why the change? 
Well, originally, when it was first proposed in uh, 2013, when uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping came to office, uh, it was called the uh, One Belt, One Road Strategy. Mm -hmm. And then there were some pushback, feeling that it was a little bit more aggressive than what the Chinese had intended. So that's why they toned it down to a bridge road initiative rather than uh, a strategy. And in a previous uh, segment, I remember we talked about it, and I said, China over the years have gradually exhausted their dynamic source of growth internally. So the Belt Road Initiative is trying to get their source of growth externally. And for example, we talked about uh, real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, China's construction slowed down and potentially could still slow down even more. But with the Belt Road, with their building factories, building roads, building railroads in India, Pakistan, uh, in Africa, the steel production, cement production and such can be maintained even though China is not building domestically. So this is what I mean by getting the source of growth externally rather than internally. And uh, if you look at our earlier discussion and previous uh, segment, the belt is what we mean by the old Silk Road, while the road is the 21st century maritime Silk Road, which for those that are history buffs, and uh, I remember mentioning this in the earlier taping, the uh, maritime Silk Road interesting, interestingly uh, mirrors and coincides with the uh, maritime travels of Admiral Zheng He in the Ming Dynasty in the uh, late 14th, early 15th century. Mm -hmm. And so we know that uh, the Belt Road or Bridge Road Initiative now, as it's called, is uh, helping China continue its growth, the GDP that we're talking about. That's contributing to their growth, as you mentioned. And we know that uh, the idea here is for China to build relationships with countries all across Asia, into Africa, and of course other parts of the world where they have trading partners. And as a strategy, is this, is this working out for them in terms of mergers and acquisitions and things of that nature? Uh, yes, China, uh, China's uh, cro what we call cross-border, meaning merger and ac acquisition of Chinese firms buying up uh, outside firms has skyrocketed since the uh, Belt Road Initiative. I've done quite a few research on that, and uh, if we have time, uh, which we don't have now, I understand, <laughs> uh, we, we, that is something certainly uh, worth looking into. Couple of things, it has been fairly successful. Uh, one of them, probably one of the more uh, uh, notable is China's buying of Volvo. Mm. Volvo is now a Chinese company. Uh, and a lot of other companies like uh, more smaller one, uh, I think Smith or something, the world's largest pork uh, manufacturer, ham and such, Chinese. ADT, okay. home protection, Chinese. Mm -hmm. So these are just examples. Uh, I think what you were trying to uh, allude to is the geopolitical aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And I do think a lot of countries, including the U.S., are quite concerned about China in their bridge road extending their influence, not just economically, but di directly or indirectly into political influences. That, at the beginning, China's economics of BRI was not successful, and I criticized China for it because they were relying too much on state-owned enterprise. But China, through cross-border merger and acquisition, has now moved up from government firms to more private firms. And I feel it's gaining momentum and is becoming more successful. And so it's becoming an integrated economic enterprise when you have state-owned oper uh, operations as well as getting into the corporate or private sector. So having said that, let's talk about the relationship geopolitically with uh, Russia now. And this involves economics. Uh, President Xi and uh, President Putin 
have been seen famously in the last few months signing agreements for energy and oil and raw materials and one would assume food security is part of this as well. And then we have this war in Ukraine, which the West has completely condemned uh, Putin for and Russia and imposed uh, a variety of sanctions on Russia. It seems like every day there are new sanctions on Russia. China has not gone along with that. They have uh, affirmed that they do have partnership with Russia uh, on at least these economic initiatives. Where's China going with this? Um, they have not criticized Putin, but they're staying fairly quiet about it. Um, so what are they doing in terms of looking at this relationship with Russia and how, how it will impact China with the rest of the world? Uh, from a global strategy point of view, over the last couple of years, uh, we know the uh, tension between the U.S. and China has been escalating. Uh, it has moved from uh, saber rattling to real sanctions by the Trump administration. And uh, the Biden administration doesn't seem that uh, they're going to loosen up anytime soon. Uh, China naturally will have to look for allies or alternative structures, if we may. And uh, historically, uh, China and Russia has had a turbulent relationship even some domestic violence, if I may say so. Uh, for example, in the 50s, uh, China called Russia their big brother, mm -hmm. the sun in the sky, mm -hmm. uh, where China's uh, military and industrial technology were supported by Russia. It soured in the 1960s, but because of the geopolitical alliance, the uh, rising tension between China and the U.S., this alliance is a long, long time coming and only natural. And so we're talking about natural resources. So in this relationship, this strengthening relationship today, what does Russia get out of it from China and what does China get out of it from Russia? Well, China mainly gets out of from Russia cheap energy. China in the 90s was a uh, energy exporting country. And uh, I am not totally sure, but I think in a previous segment, I showed a graph where when the world price of oil started to skyrocket, that was because China switched from an oil exporting country to a ma major oil importing country. So in a previous segment, we discussed that. China's thirst for energy is only going to increase. And they are also trying to improve their environment. So rather than trying to drill and produce oil domestically, if they can get a reliable resource, source of gas and energy at a discount currently, of course they will be uh, going for it. As we talk about this partnership of Russia and China, it seems like China has the upper hand economically just because of what we've been talking about with the uh, bridge road initiative and the um, cross-border um, merger and acquisitions that are going on. And not to mention China's uh, relationship with Europe and with the United States in terms of trade. So doesn't China have the upper hand? And uh, how are they going to look at this over the long run? Because China does tend to look at the big picture over the long run. Yes, China, uh, China's short run is often America's long run. <laughs> uh, but you are right, China is looking at it uh, that way. And uh, the relative positioning of Russia and China has changed dramatically. When I mentioned the 1950s, uh, Russia's GDP was 30 times that of China. Now it's reversed. So uh, I think when we move down from the road, uh, Russia will be call, calling China big brother. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, if I were Russia, I would be a little bit concerned. It's almost like uh, someone stranded at sea. You are thirst for water and don't have fresh water and you're drinking salt water. And in the long run, that is not going to be good. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in the long run, uh, Russia will be uh, with a shorter side, uh, shorter of the stick. A lot of people are looking at China uh, in terms of Taiwan. What is China thinking about in terms of looking at the world's reaction 
to Russia in Ukraine, what are they thinking about in terms of Taiwan? I know the situation is different. What are the differences between Russia and Ukraine and China and Taiwan? Uh, there are obviously a lot of similarities. And uh, the fundamental reason that China is not willing to stand up and condemn Russia's aggression is because by doing that, they have basically uh, self-incriminated themselves to some extent, pre preventing them from doing anything similar to that to Taiwan. So I think that's one of the main reason that uh, China is doing that. So China, of course, is watching intently, not just on the military action, but on the effect of sanction and what types of sanction. Uh, I feel one of the things China has learned very quickly is probably not to put too much of their foreign reserve outside of China, which Russia did, and keep a lot of uh, domestically or ways that they can avoid uh, 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 sanctions. Uh, so China is walking a fine line. On the one hand, China wants to maintain, as I said, not put them self-incriminate themselves, uh, maintain a good relationship with Russia, uh, but also they don't want to cross the line too much and get secondary sanctions from the West. And uh, China allying with Russia, uh, I've mentioned earlier on again in previous uh, segments, no, David did not ask me to promote our pro previous tapings. It's just that it's a continuum. But China has long been frustrated that they are not treated as equal partners. It's sort of like you have a family gathering, but they are delegated to the big child at the children's table. So China wants to be treated as an equal, and they have been working very hard in the past decade or so of finding an alternative to the Western-dominated uh, World Bank IMF. China now has a new development bank, which used to be called the Bank of Bricks, of the Bricks, which was established in 2015 and headquartered in either Beijing or Shanghai, I don't remember. They also have the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank in uh, 2015 also, also in China. The, the latter one, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, that is worth noting. The U.S. tried to dissuade Canada and Australia for joining. They ignored us. They joined. Real quickly, Jack, because we've run out of time. <laughs> 15, I'll, I'll give you 15 seconds. So is the world going to be more multipolar as opposed to unipolar, unipolar with America being uh, the superpower? I think it's inevitable, and I think it's a good thing. And I always remind uh, my friends, this thing happened over 100 years ago, the relationship between UK and the US. In the 19th century, UK, US gradually evened up. World War I and World War II, it shifted. Now we're seeing the same history between US and China. I hope we can find a more peaceful way of coexisting. I am Chinese, I am from Taiwan, the other China, so I am watching this keenly also. But I hope uh, we can have a more peaceful coexistence and have a more multilateral leadership. On that note, we're going to bring the program to a close. Thank you for being here today, Jack. As always, this has been interesting. My pleasure, my pleasure. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for another episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.